arguably the most unsung Governor Delta State ever had, yet his policies have touched the lives of millions of people and reformed communities. But I want to say that uh, Dr. Imola Oduan happens to be the most hated governor I have ever seen. Dr. Emmanuel Eweta Oduan is the most, one of the most misunderstood governor in this country. Some people do not, never wanted him as governor. And some people never recognized him as governor. And some people never treated him as governor. And why is that so? Because of their own individual uh, idiosyncrasies of feelings towards him. Not because he's a man of the Dwaga per se. Not because he has offended anybody per se. I'm not saying he's an angel. I'm not saying the man of Dwaga is 100%. I'm not saying, I haven't said something like that. Like every other human being, he has his own weak part. He has his own fault. But I am saying that if you say it's most misunderstood, it depends. Is the, the person who is making the assessment, is he making a genuine assessment of him? So he was more interested in developing the infrastructure and the human capacity than sharing money. The more effort the man put in terms of development, the more criticized, the more people hate him. Sometimes he finds it, I don't know, whether it's, whether it's difficult to beat his own drum. Praise himself and praise singing. Few people think differently of his noble, people-centric policies. The reason won't be far from the fact that Dr. Dwagan's administration hasn't dumped huge amounts in their bank accounts. Come with us and be the judge. In this fourth republic in Nigeria, an era of a new political renaissance in our history, a political titan and social reformer has emerged. I, Dr. Emmanuel Ewita Obama, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will be faithful, that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance, and bear true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Born on October 22nd, 1954, into the family of Chief Edmund D. Udwanga of Abiborodo in Wari North local government area of Delta State, and Mrs. Cecilia Udwanga of Ubiaja in Asan South East local government area of Edo State, young Emmanuel began his primary school in Baptist Primary School, Mosoga, where he was a pupil between 1961 and 1966. Thereafter, he proceeded to Federal Government College, Wari, for his secondary education from 1968 to 1974. In furtherance of his quest for higher education and the desire to upgrade himself intellectually for the challenges of life, Dr. Udwa proceeded to the University of Benin, Edo State, in 1975 to study medicine and surgery. A choice inspired mostly by his undying urge for selfless service through bringing soccer to the sick. Inspired by the urge for selfless service to the people and a broader spectrum, Dr. Oduan ventured into politics with its prospects of abundant opportunity for service to humanity. Unlike most of his contemporaries, he began his political career in the grassroots. Founding member of the grassroots democratic movement, GDM, he rose to become an executive officer of the party. Dr. Oduan was part of the system from the very beginning. It was part of the Ibori dynasty. And because of the success story of James Onef Ibori, we wanted a continuity. Today, he is a foundation member of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. In recognition of his brilliance in the field of medicine, his predecessor, Governor James Ibori, appointed him the Honorable Commissioner for Health in 1999. To prove his mettle, he turned the state around from the neglect suffered during the military era in Nigeria. New hospitals were built and existing ones rehabilitated. Things that have known him over this period, both at the party level, at the governmental level, 
and now as the chairman of the party for seven years and eight months. So, so I have known him over the years. And um, if you have worked with somebody or you have stayed with somebody for this period, you should be able to know the person. Uh, my assessment of him, I, you may not like him, you may hate him, but you must concede that uh, uh, Dr. Dwaga is, is intellectually sound. In June 2003, he was elevated to the post of the secretary to the state government. Judging from his antecedents, there could not have been a better choice. At the time he was appointed as secretary to government, many of us thought that being a politician, you know, he may not have time for nitty gritties. He may not have time for looking into details. And as is usual, he may not even give too much consideration to rules and regulations. But we were disappointed, so to say, pleasantly disappointed for the fact that we found in him somebody who was a great respecter for the rules and regulations. He has eyes for details. You, you may not know the quantity of uh, documentation, by way of files, uh, memos that go through His Excellency. I think the man reads every line. Honestly speaking, as at the time he came in 2007, there couldn't have been a better choice. That's the honest truth, because we needed then, we needed somebody who understood the state very well. We needed somebody who has a spread. Sani Chakiri man, born and brought up in Urubu land, and that makes him to cover two senatorial districts out of three. His sojourn in government exposed him to the third senatorial district, meaning he was in Asaba for eight years before becoming a governor. And having been commissioner for health and became SSG, to be an SSG for four years means you have met virtually anybody who you are supposed to meet in this state. Because most of those people who meet the governor definitely meet you, or the governor is referring them back to you. So that gave him the spread. Then his quiet disposition and his ability to tackle issues also gave him an edge. So as at the time he became the governor of the state, they couldn't have been a better choice. In 2007, about 13 political parties fielded candidates for the April 14 gubernatorial elections. The frontline contenders were Dr. Emmanuel Udwanga and Chief Great Ogboru for the People's Democratic Party and Democratic People's Party, respectively. The battle for the people's mandate took the two candidates to the nooks and crannies of the state. Dr. Udwanga showed more commitment in the campaign with a well thought through policy that will benefit the citizens of the state. The campaign team toured local government areas, visited traditional leaders, youth groups, professional bodies, and various interest groups. He indeed communicated his program to the people of the state effectively. In the end, the people spoke. A new visionary leader emerged. He beat his opponents convincingly to return elected as the governor of Delta State of Nigeria. The Dr. Emmanuel Udwara administration's commitment towards good health care for the people of Delta can only be described as legendary and worthy of emulation. This has ensured better medical care for the citizens of Delta and the neighboring who are also beneficiaries of this policy. The primary target of the administration was first to reduce mortality and morbidity, to reduce number of deaths and illnesses amongst the citizenry of Delta State. And in doing that, we, we first have to look at the hospital distributions. Well, there were some local government headquarters that have no hospital. 
as at when we came in, like the one at Itsiokolo. We ensure that we built an, a hospital and commission it. The hospital is operational now. The one at Udu headquarters um, was also built by this administration and commissioned. And basically now, before we leave in, um, basically all local government headquarters and every local government have a, an average hospital of about two or three. So today we have about 56 government hospitals. So you have most of the local government having two or minimum of one. Hospitals have always been there. But the problem has been the issue of people going and not being able to get attended to because they don't have the prerequisite form, you know, for the, for the care. A free maternal health care program was inaugurated by the governor, His Excellency Dr. Emmanuel Oweta Odoan. Um, the program was launched at the Central Hospital Uyeli. That is a star program of this administration, the free maternal health care program. Since the program started till now, we have had a record of about 368,000 pregnant women who have registered with us. And of this, about 60% have also delivered in our hospitals, some through caesarean section, but basically, um, primarily and majority of them through normal delivery. Maternal mortality rate, which is the index or the indicator of how efficient this our program is, of how we have succeeded in reducing maternal deaths, has also been very, very good. Before, when we started in 2007, let me start from 2005, um, a survey that was conducted by UMPF in 2005 showed that the maternal mortality rate was 456 by every 100,000 deaths, every 100,000 deliveries. But it started moving down. In 2007, when the program started, when we checked, after a year, it was about 360 something. Then it started moving down gradually, gradually, gradually. As at 2012 to 2013, um, it was 188 by 100,000 delivery. So you can see, like I said, when he came on board in 2007, how there was a sharp decline in the maternal mortality ratio, which is what we're really excited about, and all the other MDG goals. So you see our public hospital became a place, people drifting from private hospital to public hospital. The end result is that I've had some doctors actually complaining that they have lost all their patients to the government hospital. Um, many maternity homes in Wari, Agbo, Uyeli, Sapne, Asaba have closed down because of what the government is doing. They have always been, as you will know, before we came in, low patronage on the part of government hospital. But now, the reverse is the case. In, in the free rural health scheme, we met with a lot of people, treated a lot of medical conditions. We had achieved um, renal transplant quite um, recently and it's a year and some months later, and the patients are alive. In fact, they gave an interview recently of how they will be dead now if the governor hadn't intervened. And I know he did those um, for free. Some were blind for 10 years, some for five years. You know, they were all able to regain their sight. For those who had unilateral cataracts on one eye alone, they were also removed. So during the administration of Dr. Emmanuel Lewita Odoa, a lot of people could go to the hospital. That barrier to receiving free treatment, barrier to receiving treatment in the hospital was removed. So all patients going for dialysis in our hospitals, the teaching hospital and the central hospital worry, only pay 5,000 per session. So this is made possible. The remaining amount is being paid by the Delta State government. You know, the, the renovation of a coup is another landmark you know, that we need to talk about. If you've been to the hospital some years back, maybe 10 years back or eight years back or six years back, and what it is today, that is another teaching hospital in the making. Anytime, anywhere, any, you know, 
any day. Um, the free ambulance service that we operate in also is another land, landmark you know, which we made. In, uh, today, if you are anywhere in Delta and you call the ambulance telephone number, you know, someone in the call room will answer. And in less than five minutes, ten minutes, the ambulance will be with you. The MCC Worry is a place that you need to visit. We are proud of it. There is another in Aitma that is near completion, almost 95% completed. Um, yes, Worry. Why Worry? Because Worry was turning out the highest number of deliveries and the highest number of antenatal care attendant uh, from our list. In fact, worry constitutes one-tenth of all the total deliveries and pregnancy rate. Overall, I would say this government has done well, and I would say that Delta State in 2012 achieved the MDG goal set from Nigeria, which is to get to a quarter of our maternal mortality deaths. It tells you the woman who has been able to go and give birth safely, freely, is the legacy he wants to leave. Education is the single most influential factor in the development of the mind. Minds make up states and nations. Delta has been blessed with the brightest minds in the nation. This is due to the quality, suitability of the manpower and sustainability of sound educational policies and infrastructure put in place to drive this dream. At the time this administration came in, most of the schools in Delta State were in a serious state of disrepair. They were down. And I wrote a letter to His Excellency to say, Your Excellency, this is the situation of schools in Nubia. And I attached the photographs. Please intervene. First of all, he was embarrassed that in 21st century Delta State, we could have schools in such a shoddy situation. But guess what? Because he's a governor who prepared for the job, he's a proactive governor, he swung into action immediately, and today you can see total infrastructural transformation in the education sector. We have 25 local governments in these states. It has touched every local government in terms of development, infrastructural development of primary, primary schools and secondary schools. Um, one, of these, one of the schools we can just treat, mention is uh, the St. Patrick's College here in Asaba. I mean, the, the structures we have there now can pass for a university structure. It's one of the best I have seen anywhere in Nigeria, on the talk of Africa. Now, if you go to Nana College Worry, I mean, it's a wonderful, it's, that's a school that is uh, virtually becoming something, something that belongs to the old days. But today, if you go to Nana College Worry, they are even back to having uh, dormitories and uh, boarding, boarding facilities, which is something that's, that belongs to the past. That structure too is one of the best structures I've seen anyway. And, there are many other schools. Go to uh, Modern Mother Primary School, Abiborodo. Go to um, Ugeli. Go to every part of the every part of the state. You see one structure. Every 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 you know. If I, apart from he is doing this, even the constituency projects of honourable members of the house, he has a relationship with the, with members that to say that look, uh, members, your constituency project should be limited to schools alone. And to that, every member in the last eight years has impacted on education in their various constituencies. So this helps to develop our schools. We are aware that in this one state that we have uh, more than four means in which any student, anybody who is ready to learn can access funds in this state, various forms of scholarship, the usual bursary, the law uh, student bursary, the first class graduate bursary, and I think there are two others, about five schemes. So if you don't have access to one, you must have access to the other, uh, the other uh, funds. This is a way we have helped, and of course you know that for the secondary school level, there is no payment of fees. Uh, the school picks up the WIC fee, picks up the NECO fee, and this is a rare thing that uh, hardly happens, because most people announce for education as to mean just go to school and don't pay fee. But here it includes paying for your external exams. Schools, education, the phase of infrastructure in the educational uh, system, has changed greatly. In this area, the children are happy, the teachers are happy. It is obvious that if you visit a great number of our schools, you will begin to doubt if they are actually public schools 
or facilities built just to entertain persons or like hotels because they are up to date and well equipped to provide the best in terms of education. And imagine where you know uh, the governor put together resources to further train you know our deltans outside this country. You know, those who are first class and of course the the lawyers, the medical doctors, every sector in the academic field, government has spent so much money in training the people, training our children, our brothers and sisters. And one of the areas that I really appreciate the, the government is that this you know, scholarship is meant for the less privileged. More than 95% is meant for the less privileged. So it's not just for all for the deltas, people who cannot afford. You know, government pay their bills. Outside this country, the investor of their choice. The one I really prize most is our scholarship program for first class students. I believe this nation has not paid enough attention to its first class uh, citizens, and particularly the young ones. The, we we will not be able to make full use or to expose our, our people to all the opportunities that are available internationally. In other words, with the first class uh, scholarship for our graduates to study in any university of choice all over the world, we'll be able to build a pool of intellectuals. The schools in Delta are the most autonomous, as it were. Apart from the fact that we just pay their salaries, most other things that they do, they do them independently. And having satisfied ourselves that we've done the best we can do as far as infrastructure for secondary schools and primary schools are concerned, we must go to the teachers. A teacher now comes to the school, fine environment, good classrooms, good laboratories, good playground. Is the teacher happy himself? Have we taken care of his welfare? And so that is why in Delta State, if a teacher is on level eight, civil service grade level eight, and his core civil servant in Asaba, for example, is on level eight, a teacher in Delta State earns 27.5% higher than the non-teacher in the civil service of the same salary grade. So if an assistant director is on, level, is on level 16 and a teacher is on level 16 in Delta State, that teacher on level 16 earns 27.5% higher than the assistant director on level 16. And then the governor also decided, okay, make it possible for teachers in the secondary schools to rise to salary grade level 17. And it's a policy in Delta State that 50 teachers in the secondary schools at any given time are on level 17. So as some retire, you promote them all from level 16. And then it now became possible, it's now possible for teachers in Delta State to rise to the enviable rank of a permanent secretary. So we have many principals now who have been promoted to the rank of permanent secretary in Delta State. These are all welfare packages. You've been hearing that uh, in some states, teachers have not been paid for four, five, six months, where well, I don't blame the governors of those states because the economy of the country is down. But no teacher in Delta State is old. Of course, no civil servant is old in Delta State. All that is about welfare, so that the people can put in their best in teaching. <laughs>
that this is a man that inherited a troubled Delta state. A troubled Delta state. A Delta state that was in turmoil. A Delta state that was boiling. A Delta state that was fragmented according to the different ethnic nationalities. As you are aware, there was a lot of restedness by the people in the oil producing areas. It got to a point in this area, in Wari Metropolis, you have to write your identity on your buildings. Then you will see Yoruba man house, house man house, Okpe man house, because the Okpe man will not even write Robo man house. He will write Okpe man house because there was this crisis then in court of Robo Ijo and Shekiri. So people try to define their local dialect. Nobody wants to say Robo man house. He says Okpe man house, Uvie man house, Igbo man house, Isha man house. But today I challenge you, drive around Wari Metropolis. You will not see any of such anymore. Why? In our university days, we used to say, Kulu, 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 Tempa. All Tempa had become down. Once there is peace, which in fact starts from justice, justice, you have peace. And when you have peace, you have security. When you have security, you have created the enabling environment for people to carry out their own activities, their God given potentials. So it's very significant that in any environment, you must have peace and security. No matter how laudable your programs are, no matter whatever you are thinking in your mind that you want to do for people, if there's no peace and there's no security, you won't achieve anything. Uh, this led to the super deck being set up as a means of assuaging uh, the restiveness and as a means of involving the people of the oil producing areas uh, in the management of the resources that is generated from oil itself. A set of various things, a set of what they call river security, river security, where the body of and the judge were involved, Chikris and the robots were involved. That's a committee, okay? A set of unfunded desopadek. A larger part of the function of the role of the super deck is actually in the maintenance of peace in the environment. That the super deck is, you know, as we, as we look at the oil producing areas and faithfully funded it, and that the super deck also added in ensuring that the people of the rural areas who are the predominantly the oil, 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 the oil producers in this state, yeah. Um, find a reason to live, in, live peacefully among themselves. We have five ethnic nationalities that make up the Sopadek. It is the Shakiris, the Jaws, the Robos, the Sokos, and the Indokwas. And our project has been tailored to the needs of the individual ethnic nationalities. With the environment on which you are preached, some hostile, some friendly, to him, and some perpetually hostile to him, not because he's a man of Luduaga, but because of where he's coming from. And so you can see where he now, he, one of his cardinal, this was, I think, peace, uh, peace and security. And that was why he was able to do, so to that extent, they have been peace in this state throughout his eight period. It's not, there's no where you cannot have skirmishes, disagreements, and fighting, but generally, it has succeeded very well in that part of his agenda, peace and security in the state. Having been used to settling crisis between the Jews and the Shekiris, and even not just the Jews and the Shekiris, bringing peace to the entire data set, for the robots, uh, part of it was there. So, Udwa knows very well that he needed peace for him to excel in his objection, and that he maintained, and that's what he still maintained it today. You can see disagreement between the Jews and the Shekiris, or between the Shekiris and the Jews, have been reduced to the barest minimum. Barest minimum. And uh, of course, we can credit Dr. Udwa with that peace initiative. Given the environment in which he operated, he has been able to meander various, within the various ethnic groups, to meander to be able to carry them along for do this period. Now, if you look at, too, 
the voting pattern, like I keep on saying, people will start, who are the people who have been voting for him? Where has he been getting his vote? Those people who didn't vote for him, where, is it because it's Emmanuel Ludwig that they didn't vote for him? Or is it because he failed? No, it is because of the age-long disagreements or issues that have been on the ground. But he has been able to carry them along. Four years before he became the governor of Dancer State, he was the secretary to state government. And uh, in the history of Delta State, when, while he was the secretary to state government, he was the most summoned secretary to state government. In fact, since then, nobody has been able to summon any secretary like that anymore. If every minute, every day, every problem we have between the House of Assembly and the then the uh, uh, James Ibori administration, Dr. Emmanuel Odoan is always was always in the House to answer questions on the decisions or policies of James Ibori's administration. So when he came in. With that experience of handling the house as the secretary to the state government, it, it became very easy for him to handle crises or things that would have happened between the government. So instead of the secretary, I mean, uh, the, the, his, his own secretary being summoned, he's almost everywhere, ensuring that there's peace between both sides. You know, where, where we have problems, it, it, you know, so we call us to the government house, we sit down, we talk, and we act as family. And he took a, I mean, he, he treats our problems like his problem. And um, he, he makes sure that every entitlement of the house that the house gets, he respects the house. It's, I mean, he respects the speaker. He respects every legislator. So because of that, you know, every, I mean, we looked up at him as our father, our leader. And at the same time, you know, for every program before, the, before his budget, I mean, he reads his budget to the house every year. You see, I mean, we normally have something they call dinner, you know, pre-budget dinner. And when he invites us for that dinner, he discusses his policies, his plans. And we, we rub minds and agree. So it made this makes, I mean, uh, him like running an inclusive governance where every part of the administration is involved. Coming into the, the government house, he came with peace and security as major and gender. And in closing, he exhibited that as a peaceful man. He sacrificed a lot to give Delta State peace. So he'll be, he'll be remembered, highly remembered by the fact that his peace agenda is not lip service. He personally sacrificed his own well-being to make sure that Delta State remain united and a peaceful state. We hardly hear about so many crises in so many places in Delta State. And it's significant. And I think that that is a huge achievement for this government. Kudos must be given to Dr. Emmanuel Wotadwa for creating an environment that is conducive for development, and that is peace and security. As I speak to you, we are constructing a road, they call it Obeji. Obeji, okay? Big worry. Okay? Now, um, that bridge, that one has... Um, uh, Transworld, they call it Transworld Road, or the Chekri, where it will end. It has, um, it is about 30 km, 33 kilometers with 33 bridges. Okay, we well, have gone very far on that. that that's, that's one. The rural area has to be connected, it's very important. We're doing a bridge across Egbo to Ayakurumo. Egbo is, uh, is in Ogele South, Ayakurumo is in the local government. Okay? We are also we have also connected the route to a big borodo from Sapele to Aron. Okay. That is in addition to the ones earlier done by our predecessor, the uh, Abo Bridge, the Bomadi Bridge, the uh, Omadino Bridge. We are also doing a bridge across Eku River to connect the other villages. And that bridge will be, need to be completed to be commissioned later this month before the end of the administration. So in terms of, and then of course we have internal routes in, the, in various rural communities. Like in Ojibwe, for example, um, in Torgbone, for example, in Ayakurume, for example, in Akubun. These are rural areas that we also have various forms of uh, internal routes that have been done. So the, the, if, if we finish the bridge from Igbo to Ayakurume, we'll tend to link Brutu from there by land, by road. Okay. So, in no time, um, in addition to the, the one to be done by NGDC towards various villages after Bumandi, 
we're likely to have a state that is properly integrated, where an investor can invest in any part of the state, and connecting the state capital wouldn't be difficult. It's the only state in this country where you can traverse everywhere without coming across a border. You don't until you go to another state because you may not believe what I'm telling you until you go to another state. Where you see oh, the port of Pedro as we describe it, of the, 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 of, of the state. We also have, you know, C4. This is a world assisted program that uh, uh, has come to assist in the area of waste uh, management and, of course, uh, some other infrastructural you know, activity within Ministry of Works and a few other ministries. Today in Delta State, uh, without breaking your bank account, you can ride in style in the popular Udwana buses uh, because we have so far purchased, distributed, and operated 705 Toyota Hayas 18 seater buses, uh, 50 Marco Polo buses, 30 high occupancy buses. Uh, the popular Tata, and um, we've been able to share some too to our tertiary institution, the nine of them. Um, we've been able to give them buses too. Uh, apart from that, we, we've yet into really making it the quick win by providing the, the popular Keke Udwa. Um, they used to call it Keke Nape, but today it's Keke Udwa in Delta State because with the banning of Okada, which does not meet any of our policy trusts and the transport policy of the, 20, uh, of the 20th century, I think we should push it away. The government, um, in collaboration with the State Security Council, decided to do away with Okada in some of our major cities and introduce the Keke. And Delta State remained the only state in the entire nation that has provided alternative after the ban of Okada. Uh, our governor, Udua don't do, we touch me for life. We say, he don't do road for us. He build the bridge for us. Well, the next, the normal thing when I benefit now, they fly over when you do for us, for interval and about. That is normal thing I will say I benefit from it. Um, one of the projects they did I love most is um, this flyover they did actually. This um, flyover behind the corner road. Uh, that's one I wrote. That was the, the, one of the things I may say the governor tried. And also the schools, the innovation of the schools, the primary schools also. Government went further to build an incinerator between Ibuzo and Asaba. You see an incinerator that has the capacity to take a 1,000 tonnage every, every day um, to, uh, so as to reduce the waste. Of course, what is that equipment? Uh, people are going to be buying manure from there. People are going to be employed. I mean, provision of employment for the unemployed. So we can, uh, you, know, you know, get away some of the unemployed from there. If you come from the riverine area, you should be able to join bus. And if you are going outside the state, you should be able to drive with that bus to the, to the airport where you fly to wherever you are flying to. And that is the bed of the Asaba International Airport. Uh, I judge one of the airport of the fisher in Nigeria today. So uh, for the riverine areas, we bought a total of 130 water buses, ultra-modern water buses, uh, which, were, which were actually distributed to people in the riverine areas, people who are grounded in the running of uh, riverine transportation um, with very minimal return uh, on, on a monthly basis. Uh, so it, it, it's effective. We, we didn't just look at that side. The government veered into the airport too. And uh, today the airport is there too. Uh, it's one of the youngest and one of the best in the country. So you can see the various methods or approaches of diversifying the economy. You have infrastructure that drive the diversification, like roads, like the airports, like human capital development. like beautification of our towns, like managing traffic congestion to make our cities more livable, more uh, movement friendly, like the Asaba flyover, the Wari Ifun flyover. All of this to ensure that um, there's movement of people smoothly 
all through the state. A place that is not accessible can, have de can never be developed. One of the indices of development is accessibility. We had to find out what was responsible for the level of insecurity within the state. And part of it was lack of engagement, unemployment, and then lack of skill on the part of the, uh, the labor force that we had. They didn't have the necessary skill to be able to be engaged to do the kind of work that was available. And so he had to develop that agenda of instilling peace and security within the state. And if the people who were as readily available as soldiers in the course of insecurity, he had to also train them to acquire the necessary skill. And that was how the issue of human capital development came about. On infrastructure development, no economy, no state can grow without infrastructure. And if you build the infrastructure, you needed the human beings who would be able to run them, who would be able to provide the type of service that is required, skillful persons. And so that also has to do with human capital development. So if you need to build a strong economy, you needed to have a secured environment. Added to that is to have well-trained human beings who had reasonable uh, standard of living, healthy atmosphere, and then infrastructure on the basis of which services can be rendered. But we are talking of data beyond oil. You are talking of the skilled labor force. We believe that after GS3, there are two openings for the children passing out of GS3. Those who want to go purely academic to go and write their work exams, those who want to go technical to go for NAPTEP exams. Those are the ones we need in the industry. So we cannot be doing data beyond oil without preparing people who man the industries. So we are taking uh, the, the technical schools very, very seriously. Future yeah. generation. To, uh, to play a role, yes. Then you now have the microcredit, creating a pool of um, entrepreneurs. What makes a country really great? What generates employment? It's not government, it's the entrepreneurs. The small scale, the medium, and the large. I remember when I was growing up, <coughs> there was no unemployment in my village. Everybody was doing something for reward. There was full state of employment. I think that is the, 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 the what the governor has in mind in introducing a micro uh, credit program to empower our people. Uh, Delta has always had um, SME loans, for instance. What is done since for the small medium enterprises and all of that. But it came in and changed your concept and targeted uh, poverty eradication or alleviation and it took on a new life on its own. Uh, it became it became a cabinet position, which brought it to the fore. And today, the benefits are there for everybody to see. From most of the athletes, most of the tennis players, the state tennis, play, tennis players, the state squash players, and the, even the field athletes, we all come here to train. And this club has really contributed in order to the development of sports in Delta State. If we saw tomorrow, he knew that, look, even if oil is there, there's nothing called glut. It can just be there all over the place and then, and then the value drops. When the value drops, money coming to you also drops. How do you now run your economy? He is a major store in this administration was to create delta beyond oil. The reason is this. He, he knew ab initio on time at the first tenure of his government, of this government, that Nigerians cannot be depending on, solely on oil. Data beyond oil, simply put, in summary, in one sentence, it's up to one sentence. Actually, in one compound word, self-sufficiency. 
That's the whole definition of simplicity. The whole idea about Delta Beyond Oil is about self sufficiency. That simply means that, please, as a state, we should move away from dependence in a single product. There is no building that that building is Delta Beyond Oil. It's those infrastructures that we are putting in place that can make the state to become self independent without relying on 30 days to Abuja. 30 days to Abuja, I mean waiting to go and collect FAC. Because the day the oil ceases to flow, then you have nothing to go and collect in Abuja. So what the governor has put in place is a situation where in between now when the oil will cease to flow, what can we use the oil money to do so that after the oil era, the state can stand on its own. That means if people refuse to buy our oil today, what happens to Delta State? Can we live as a state? Are we saying that there are no other potentials in this state that we can tap into other than oil revenue? Are we giving all our destiny, life, and everything about us to the hands of other people to dictate for us? Purpose of setting up the super deck is actually to develop the oil producing areas is to bring about infrastructural development and to create economic activities also uh, in the oil producing area, thereby uh, reducing unemployment. The governor had a foresight to say that where we must drive the economy of the state beyond the oil resources by using the oil process to build a diversified economy. And one of the things that he looked at was the port in Coco, the market we have in Onicha, and how to link some of, most of these, these two positions, because we don't have any of such ports around this eastern zone, other than Port Harcourt and Lagos. So the purpose of um, trying to dualize that road was to not create a route or a route, as the Americans would say, where goods can be transported from the cocoa port to the main market, the largest market in Africa today, which is the Onicha market. And if you look at that particular, if you look at that particular road, it cuts across several communities. And most of those communities too have this farm produce that they have to take to the market. So if you look at the multi-dimensional advantage of this road. I think His Excellency has already looked Delta beyond Royal before he agreed to dualize this road. And let me, let me first of all mention something, let me not forget to mention something. It's the most ambitious project ever overtaken by any state government. What can we use the oil money to do so that after the oil era, the state can stand on its own? And you see, it's very visionary because when this project started three years or four years ago, when they, co they conceived it, nobody knew that the price of oil was going to go down the way it is now. The state allocation from nearly 20 billion naira is today under 10 billion. So that is what he foresaw when he initiated Delta Beyond Oil. And what's Delta Beyond Oil? Today you have an airport in Asaba. Today you have a trade-free zone in Koko. Today you are having the EPZ in Ogidigbe. Those are data beyond oil projects. Because these are the things that will bring investment to the state. And once there is invest, investors are coming to the state, then, then of course, the state government, the pressure of the state government to employ people even when it does not need those hands will reduce. Once you open the ports, the pressure on government employment will reduce. And the more investors come to the state, the more people will be employed. The more people are employed, the more taxes that will be collected to government. This is data beyond oil. The three-point agenda that is over act with um, the data beyond oil has demonstrated, has demonstrated clearly that it purposefully and systematically pursued and continued even after us, we turned this data to an economic hub that we compare favorably with any other economic hub in the world. The 
man did so well. And if I'm going to rate him, I'll give him excellence. I doubt even if his enemies can say he has done badly. So I can say that yes, this has brought and have imparted sufficient deal uh, in Roboland that we are proud of that. I want Deltans to remember Dr. Emmanuel Ewota Odoan, my boss, as a man who talked less, performed, and left with us in Delta, a Delta beyond oil. I tell you, the person who's going to take over from Emmanuel Ewota Odoan will have less work to do. And if he performs less, Deltans will raise alarm because Emmanuel Ewota Odoan has set a standard for people of Delta to see. He came. He sold, he conquered. Peace and security, creating an enabling environment for seamless social and economic activity. Infrastructural development, a vehicle for business and social activity, making Delta State an economic hub. Human capital development, creating self-sufficient individuals and economy to sustain Delta State far beyond the boundaries of a monoproduct economy. For Dr. Udwanga, Delta is bigger than the interest of any individual. So he was driven to render selfless service to the state and her people. This is his legacy, a promise kept. The three-point agenda that is over act with um, the data beyond oil has demonstrated has demonstrated clearly that if purposefully and systematically pursued and continued even after us we turn this data to an economic hub that we compare favorably with any other economic hub in the world.